a good friend uh, sent me something that they wanted my take on because it stretched the bounds of credulity as far as they were concerned, and they wanted to know whether or not it looked different from from uh, my perspective. Uh, Zach, can you put up that uh, tweet I sent you? Many people have been asking me how I got myocarditis despite being unvaccinated. Two days after spending time with a friend who had just received the vaccine, my heart began to have uh, severe irregularities and it took me a year to recover. Vaccine shedding is a valid concern. And this is from an account, uh, Dr. Simon Godek, who is a Brazilian. Um, he is a he has a PhD. It's not a medical degree. Uh, he's a technologist of some kind. And the question here is he's reporting. So this is not the friend. He's a friend of his. A friend forwarded this tweet mm -hmm. and said, basically, should I take this seriously? Uh -huh. And I thought that this was an excellent place to take our evolving model for a spin, right? Mm -hmm. Is this person reporting something that we all ought to be concerned about? That is to say, a recently vaccinated person shedding something, presumably uh, pseudouridine stabilized mRNAs, mm -hmm. causing uh, myocarditis, even though one was not vaccinated. Alarming, if true. So I want to tell you a little bit about the evolution of my understanding of the shedding question. Mm -hmm. So the shedding, the issue of shedding has been discussed for a very long period of time, since the beginning of the vaccination campaign. People have With reported, COVID. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, people have reported all kinds of anecdotal stuff. Now, my understanding, and I think it's your understanding as well, is that there's something very unlikely about the idea of being in close proximity to a vaccinated person and being importantly affected by something shed by them. Just, just, just at the like density dependence level of analysis. There's just not, it doesn't seem like there's enough of it. Well, it seems like there can't be enough of it for the following reason. If a person is given the inoculation, they get a huge dose, mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of particles. The amount that they could shed into the environment would be a tiny fraction of that. So the point is, if the stuff that a person sheds into the environment is itself um, lethal, right? Mm -hmm. If this was you know, polonium-like or something, then the point is the dose that they got themselves would have been so immense that you would expect nobody to survive it. Right. So the point is, one, if you take a standard model of, um, of just simply dosages and materials, this does not sound like a familiar material, that a person could get a huge amount of it injected into them and shed enough of it to cause a pathology in an, in an adjacent person. Right. Um, so anyway, that was my initial doubt. I, the day I met Robert Malone, Robert Malone came to our house, to our studio, to do Dark Horse, which is where I met him. Yep. Instantly liked the guy, right? Instantly liked the guy because he has the same love of biology that you and I do and mm -hmm. the same interest in finding somebody else who knows something about the topic and playing back and forth, just volleying, non-competitive, very interested in talking about anything you might raise. Very... Doesn't show up with the diploma going like, I stopped learning back in whenever it was I graduated, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm read-only now, right? Like, good scientists are never read-only. Right. And, you know, also, very much to his credit, any time that, uh, in my case, something I said to him challenged what he had previously thought, he would admit in real time, oh, hadn't thought of it that way. Hmm, that's interesting. It might be such and such and so and so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I asked him after the podcast, I said, look, I've been hearing a lot about this shedding stuff. What do you think? And I tried not to inform him of my perspective. So I don't think there was any risk of polluting his perspective, but there would be, I wouldn't have to worry about it. Yep. And he was very dubious about shedding. Now, okay, so... I went on from that point thinking, yeah, there's something weird about this shedding story. It probably is not a significant thing. And I now have not only the fact that my model says it's very unlikely, the dosage consideration makes it unlikely, but I also have somebody who knows this topic from a completely different perspective who sees it the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will say that after that, the uh, medical dissidents have taken on 
increasing seriousness about the question of shedding. Is there a shedding phenomenon? So that is to say, in spite of the fact that a standard model of dosages would suggest this is unlikely to be significant, there is enough pattern in the universe that um, causes people who were initially dubious to wonder. Mm -hmm. And there are, in fact, some places in which shedding is probably a significant factor. Things like breastfeeding, blood transfusions, um, and potentially sex, right? Right, but that, n none of those are shedding. Well, they're shedding, but they're not shedding in the sense of, uh, you it's, know... I mean, it's, it's fluid exchange. Right, exactly. Fluid exchange is different from shedding. Exa well, it's a subcategory, but let's just say that would make sense if there yeah. was some consideration uh, in places where, where fluid is exchanged, um, but not in, you know, breathing right. in the same space as somebody, for example. Okay. So, in any case... We have updated our model. There are some special cases which might have an important relevance. And uh, I believe, sadly, there is some evidence that suggests there have been some injuries from this. Mm -hmm. But then we have a claim like the one in this tweet. Now, the one in the tweet, I don't want to fault the person who uh, reports this because they are reporting something factual. Now, I'm in no position to check their facts. But what they're saying is that there was a temporal, uh, a temporal alignment of their presence with a recently vaccinated person, and then this symptom showing up, which has been shown to be the product of, uh, it's an adverse event that follows mRNA vaccination. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is there something going on that suggests the model is incomplete? Is this person actually reporting an ab adverse event from an inoculation that they didn't get or not? Uh, two days after spending time with a friend who had just received the vaccine, my heart began to have severe irregularities and it took me a year to recover. Um, well, I mean, I, I, again, we don't know this person, we right. don't know anything about his life, but, um, you know, pointing, pointing to a two days after and then I've had a year of sounds like a kind of temporal causality, but it doesn't say anything about all of the other things that this person was doing for, you know, those two days, the seven days before, the month before any of it, right? right. Like, did they did they have COVID, right? Like, you know, there, there's all sorts of things that might have been true. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's a very selective story, as stories always are. Right, but... Uh, but, but it... But it, it certainly doesn't demonstrate anything with the kind of assurance that the tone suggests. Right. Well, this demonstrates nothing. We agree yeah. with that. The question is, could it be indicative of something? It could. Is it likely to be indicative of something? I don't think so. Now, if we go back to the model of vaccine injury that, uh, that I presented, Mm -hmm. The model whereby the transfection of cells around the body haphazardly results in the immune system attacking the cells that are making this foreign protein because the immune system effectively assumes that those cells have been virally infected and it is programmed to destroy virally infected cells. Mm -hmm. Is that likely to be going on here as a result of shedding? And could it be causing this myocarditis? And here's what I would say and what I said to the, the friend in question. Dosage suggests that that is near impossible. That it is not impossible that a stabilized mRNA could escape a vaccinated person, be taken in by breathing or some other mechanism by somebody who hadn't been vaccinated, could transfect a cell, and that that cell could be destroyed by the immune system. But the point is, the degree of harm that would come from a small number of these instances right. would be so tiny that it would be undetectable. In fact, when a really good vaccine is based on the technology uh, of attenuation, an attenuated virus vaccine infects cells and the immune system does kill them, right? Mm -hmm. And the point is, there's not a pathology that comes from a good vaccine because it's a small number of cells. It may be millions, but mm -hmm. uh, it's a small number of cells. But so there is cell death. Right, there is cell death. And so the point is, if, you're, if you were able to measure finely enough, mm -hmm. is it possible that somebody could shed a particle that would have this impact on a cell that would cause the loss of a heart cell in the worst case? Yeah, but you wouldn't notice it. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that myocarditis could be caused by this. Could I be wrong? 
absolutely, and I will tell you how I could be wrong on this. But my basic point is, if the thing functions the way we think it does, this story does not function, it does not, it is not causally explanatory. Yep. And um, what I would say is, remember, I every time I talk about this topic, I say, remember that myocarditis, itis, means inflammation, right? right? The reason that myocarditis is being caused by these mRNA vaccines, we now effectively know this based on what we've seen, based on what we showed last week, for example, is that there is damage to the heart, damage done when transfected cells are attacked by the immune system and destroyed, right? It's like a burn inside the heart or any other tissue, and it will be every other tissue, mm -hmm. every tissue that is perfused with blood and takes up these particles. But itis is a syndrome, it's a symptom, it is not the disease itself. So mm -hmm. the point is, this person reporting that they had myocarditis, that's not a high degree of specificity. It doesn't say that it's the same kind of myocarditis. It's a symptom it's of a something. It's a manifestation. It's a manifestation. Now, myocarditis is, is serious, Yeah. right? This person had a serious something mm -hmm. from some cause. Right, but it is unlikely to be the thing that causes people who have taken in large numbers of these mRNA uh, uh, particles to have myocarditis, which is to say an internal burn of of their heart. Right now, okay. So basically, the point here is really about well, what do you do with a model? Well, you've now heard a model about what these adverse events are. That model says that this story about somebody shedding particles and causing the same phenomenon in an unvaccinated person, unlikely to be true, at least not by the same mechanism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what the model does. It allows you to extrapolate. Does that yep. give you certainty? Absolutely not. And then I would say, I would open up another branch here, and I would say, if it turned out that there was a pattern that people who had been in proximity to those who had been transfected without having been transfected themselves showed this pattern of damage consistent with having been transfected. Mm -hmm. How is that possible, right? I'm not saying this is true, but what would I think if I saw that it wasn't one person reporting this, but it was a pattern that had been consistently demonstrated? Then I would have to say, well, you need something that would amplify the harm of a small number of particles, right? Mm -hmm. Something akin to a prion disease. So a prion disease is one in which, and by the way, there is a whole interesting topic to be explored as to whether or not prions are really uh, pathogens or whether they are just a strange kind of self-propagating error, right? Mm -hmm. But put that aside for a second. A prion is the distinction that you're making here being that pathogen in your dictionary that you've just uh, implied uh, is benefiting from its engagement with host, whereas some self-replicating error is just existing without any um, any any benefit or cost to itself from its interaction with host. Yeah. So the, really, what I'm evoking is. There's an evolutionary phenomenon going on when you have a prion. A prion is a folding uh, of a protein that is contagious. In the pathogen pathogenic case, you have a misfolding of a protein that causes other proteins with the same sequence to misfold the same way. Um, so like uh, mad cow disease. Mm -hmm. um, but the question is, is this effectively a kind of life that doesn't have any uh, DNA or RNA in it, that the information is the fold, and it is actually evolving and it's a true pathogen, or is this a kind of quirk the way cancer is, right? Cancers evolve, but most cancers are not contagious. And therefore the fact that you get a cancer is, you know, your own uh, system's failure to control a kind of runaway process. It's not, uh, cancer isn't trying to kill you. Now there are cancers. It does raise the question of like what, what is different in those few cancers that are contagious. Right, right. Like the the one that afflicts uh, Tasmanian devils. Which the, is the only one that cancer. I can come up with. There are there are several, yeah. but there are um it's definitely, as far as we know, the exception and not the rule. And the public health pattern does not reflect that it's anything other than an exception. Right. So but anyway, point being, a contagious misfolding is the kind of thing that could take a tiny dose of something and turn it into a serious problem. Just the same way mm. that a yep. virus, you may get a tiny number of particles. One of those particles gets through all of the defenses and then that particle creates 
billions of copies of itself, creating right. a pathology, right? right? The one particle would be incapable of doing it, but the fact that it copies itself causes these pathologies. So anyway, long and short of it is, hey, models are cool. You get a model of the uh, adverse events, and then you can say, well, here I'm hearing a report of an adverse event. Does it match the model? Nope. It certainly would be in conflict with the model. It might need a separate model. Mm -hmm. And if it needed a separate model, it would have to look like something with an amplifier in it. So let's assume this is an odd coincidence of a person who just happened to get myocarditis from some uh, other influence that temporally was... Uh, unfortunately connected to their proximity to some transfected person. Um, but should the pattern turn up in a uh, systematic way that demands an explanation, where did it look for explanations? Amplifiers. Amplifiers.